Yeah. Away. All right. Get ready to dig in this morning. Yeah. We're in the middle of a series entitled "This Is Us," and uh, we're talking about a Christ-centered family. And uh, I'm going to do a couple things that are a little different today. Uh, number one, um, I'm preaching from paper notes today. Uh, I have not done this, by the way, in years and years and years. And the reason is nothing overly spiritual. I uh, oh. dropped my iPad this week. And uh, it is, yes, in fact, cracked everywhere and shattered. So it's getting fixed this week. No, you know, no big deal. Anything can be fixed. Um, and I was going to, but it is getting worse and worse and worse. And more and more, the LCD uh, screen is, is losing itself. And so I'm going to paper notes. And the second thing that I'm going to do that I have, uh, I realize I have never done before. I've talked about this subject before as parts of messages. But I'm going to talk about what does it biblically mean to live a life when you're single? Um, and I realized that I had never preached an entire message on being single. What does it mean? What does it look like? And here's the last week we talked about marriage, right? So those of you that, if you're, if you're married and you weren't here last week, I talked about marriage and the laws of marriage. And there's lots of things that single people can glean from that. But I want to talk to the single people today specifically. Now, if you're married, you can glean things from the message today. Um, but here's something. I, and I don't know that I completely realized this. I kind of knew this. But as I was doing research... Did you realize that 50.2% of American adults are single? So actually, it's just statistically a little bit more that there are more single adults than there are married adults. I found that kind of interesting. And our culture, our culture has changed. People are getting married later and later and later in life. So let me just give you a couple of parameters this morning before we jump into this. First of all, I want to talk to you today if you're single, and even if you're not, I want you to listen in, regardless of how you found yourself in that state of singleness, meaning uh, you're single by choice, you're single but waiting, all right, which is kind of that most kind of uncomfortable stage of singleness, right? Uh, maybe it's a stage for you, maybe it's something you say, you know, I want to be married at some point, but not right now. Maybe you were once married and now you're single. Maybe you've encountered divorce or you've been widowed. There's a lot of different ways that people find themselves there. And I just want to encourage you with some things from God's Word today when it comes to this idea. What does it mean to live a life as a single adult and help the married people to listen in? Because I've got some words and some things for you today, maybe some encouragement for you. I want to take you back to the junior high days. You guys remember being junior highers? By the way, can I just say this? Um, I am incredibly thankful for my wife. My wife is amazing. I do remember those single years. Um, and, and, and I just want to say to those of you that are single and you're, you're looking to be married, I don't envy you at all. Okay? Um, it's incredibly difficult. And I get that. And so some of the things I'm going to talk about today are things that I've heard single people say to me. But I want to take you back to junior high days. Okay? Remember yourself as a junior high. <laughs> How many of you in junior high just loved PE? Okay. It's your favorite time. Okay. Let me take you back there. Um, some of you, and maybe it depends on your age and stuff like this, but do you remember in PE having to choose teams? Okay. Do you remember how you kind of always knew where you were going to get picked? Right? And I'm not going to ask you to tell me. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand and say, yes, I was always the last one chosen in PE. Right? But we kind of already knew that social pecking order. When, when the PE teacher would say, hey, you and you pick teams for PE, you kind of begin to slot yourself. And sometimes you kind of knew already what team you'd be on because you knew that those six people were going to be picked in front of you and pretty much those people were going to be picked after you. Or you just said, you know what, I'm going to hang out here till the end. Or maybe you were that person that you were picked first. I don't know, right? But we kind of knew that. Can I tell you something? Being a single adult kind of feels like junior high PE class. <laughs> right? You're just sitting around going and wondering, like, I just hope I'm not picked last. <laughs> and some of you are kind of like, eh. but, but the single people in the room, listen, if you haven't said it, you've probably fought it at some point. Like, am I going to be the kid at the end that, that no one else has picked? Now, let me say this. I believe with all my heart that there are people that are single by choice. You say, you know what, I, I, don't, I don't feel like that's what God has for me, and I'm going to walk a single life. Others of you say, you know what, I'm single by choice for this season. I understand that this season of my life, that God has, is preparing me, God is doing some things in my life, and I'm not to be married. And other of you say, you know what, I'm single, not necessarily by choice, but also I understand that I'm in a season 
season of singleness and I'm waiting on the Lord. So regardless of where you find yourself, all right, regardless of where that is, I want you to understand there's some things that God's Word can teach us today. I remember, as I said earlier, I remember being single. I remember getting to that point where I was old enough that it seemed as though every one of my friends were already married, right? Everyone around me, and like, it was kind of an uncomfortable thing because I knew my friends were getting together sometimes on Friday nights, but it was just the married people, okay? It was just those who kind of had already found that, and so I kind of was like, all right, cool, I gotta, you know, there's some other single people, but eh, you, I don't know, and they're all like five years younger than me, so that's a little weird, and uh, you know, so how, how do I navigate that? And asking the question, God, do you even want me to be married? Like a real honestly, have that real honest question. I remember I got to a point in my life where I said, okay, God, I'm not going to worry about this because that can really be all-consuming. All so I'm just going to let you be God. And I'll never forget one of my mentors. We we're having a conversation. I said, listen, I said, I said, you know, I've listened to a few of you. A few of you tried to set me up on dates. I kind of did the caller. We went out. It was super weird. Like, uh, I, I'm not down with that, by the way. I'm old enough that I was kind of before all the online dating stuff, all right? Um, and so I just remember getting to a place of saying, okay, God, and, and I truly now feel like it's something God spoke to me, but I remember telling my mentor, I said, listen, she's going to ask me out. <laughs> I'll never forget her response to this day. <laughs> she looked at me and she said, I love you as a friend, but you are not that cool or that good looking. <laughs> <laughs> Now, listen, we were close, right? We were close. We are friends. And uh, sure enough, Holly asked me out. So there's the rest of my story. No. Um, but it was cool because in the midst of the process, God began to speak to her. And there was a timing, right? God's timing. So what does that look like for those of you that are in this room? Like I said earlier, 50.2%. And as I looked around, I actually kind of started surveying the room this morning. And I started realizing probably more than I've ever realized before, the number of single adults that are in the room. And so what does that look like for you? Let me say this to the single people in the room. The most miserable people on earth are not the single people who wish they were married. It's the married people who wish they were single. <laughs> it's both funny and true all at the same time. Right? So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying, listen, singleness is not a curse. Right? Rushing into marriage is way worse than being single. It's okay to have a season of being single. It's okay to want to be single your entire life. Let me give you some wrong views of the idea of being single. Some people say, well, if you're single, you're only half a person. You're, you're like an Oreo without the filling. Okay? Listen, can I tell you something? That's not true. The only way to make... And somebody say, well, what do you say? And somebody, listen, I've had single people say that to me. Or they've said they've had, you know... Well-meaning parents who want grandkids say that to them, right? Kind of that fun, kidding, pressure thing. Listen, that's a wrong view. Why? Because the only way marriage truly works is when two complete people come together and then God calls that one flesh. Some people feel like when they're single that, when, that, that the problems they currently have stem from being single. I promise you this, marriage doesn't fix all your problems. It just brings two people's worth of problems together, right? And you got to work to fix them together. The perfect person could fix you. Your life is in limbo because you can't make permanent plans until you get married. Singleness is a curse and it's a sign of your lack of worth. I just want you to hear me today. If you've thought those things, heard those things, or felt those things from others, I just want you to know that none of those things are true. In fact, we're going to look at Scripture we're going to see that living a single life is very much one of the directions that the Apostle Paul and others have encouraged us in God's Word. If you ever look for books on how to live your life, you go to the self-help books, it's interesting because you'll find lots of books online and, and, and online sources. You'll find lots of stuff about marriage and raising kids and all that stuff. But you find very few books addressing this idea of what it means to live single. And not just a single, but to do so from a godly perspective. Our society, and I think rightly so, has placed a high um, priority on the institution of marriage. But 
In doing so, we run the risk sometimes of overlooking and not seeing those amongst us that are single. In fact, when we know single people, sometimes Christians believe it is their role to be matchmaker. Can I just encourage you with something today? By the way, first of all, I never want to get into that because, listen, um, I promise you this. If things don't work out, you're going to get the blame if you're the matchmaker, right? So I, I'll do the matchmaker thing. But also, I think it's also important to simply ask the question, does that person, even in this point in their life, want to be married? Is it where God has them? Is it where God is calling them to? <laughs> Here's a question I have for the married people in the room. And by the way, this isn't make you, it doesn't make you, make you feel guilty this way. I just want to kind of lay this out there to kind of help. If 50.2% of the American adult population is single, just... As a married person, when's the last time that you were going out somewhere doing something, maybe a group or other people, that you invited someone who was single to go out with you and to be a part of your circle? Just want to lay that out there really quickly. And listen, and not doing it because you're like, well, I know him and I know her, and I think they would be really good together, so we're going to invite the two of them. And then those two single people show up that are roughly the same age to this party of all married people, and they look at each other and walk in the door, and they're like, great, now I know why I'm here. <laughs> You're not kidding anybody when you do that, by the way. Right. You have to at least find three single people. <laughs> but no, it's just an honest question. Do you even think about it? Is this something I just want to encourage you? Again, not making you feel guilty, but how do we include the body of Christ? We're talking about a Christ-centered family. We are the body of Christ. We are the family of God. And so loving and caring for one another, regardless of how they found themselves there. I've heard people that that have, have walked through the pain of divorce that, that feel as though suddenly they're like, they have the plague or they're marked in some way. And listen, I don't, it's, I don't believe it's ever intentional. Maybe there are moments that it are. But often, listen, and you know this, it makes you uncomfortable. It's hard. Maybe they're going through a difficult season and you're like, hmm, maybe too much personal talk. And, you know. But here's my encouragement for you. It's okay to continue to love and to care and to, to include. In fact, it's more than okay. It's what we should do. All the more when people walk through painful and difficult situations. For the single people in the room, it becomes hard to live without the questions. Seems like every time they get together, and I've heard this expressed, every time they go together with family or go into a situation, it's, have you met anyone yet? When do you think you're going to get married? Like you could draw a date out of a hat and make it so. <laughs> and other times people even begin to question your sexuality or the decisions you're making. Especially in a polarized society. By the way, that's the way it is, right? And so, what do we do? What do we do? So here's my question then. We'll look at God's word for just a few moments. If that made you uncomfortable, the scripture is going to make you really uncomfortable this morning, all right? Is it okay? Here are two questions I just want to throw out there for us to answer from God's Word today. Is it okay to be a single Christian in the church, or can a person choose to be single for at least a time after entering adulthood? Or after a lost relationship? Or after the loss of a spouse? And the second question is, as a single Christian living in this world, how is it that you should be playing your part in society and the church? So we're going to kind of jump into those two questions. First of all, it's okay to live as a single person, whether it's entering adulthood, you choose to be single for a while, you're single after a broken relationship or a loss of a relationship, and you choose for a season to be single, right? Is that okay? What does Scripture say about that? And then, conversely, if you make that choice or you're in that season, how, what are the, what, how does that affect the way you live your life? Paul writes, if you have your Bibles to turn to 1 Corinthians, we're going to get into 1 Corinthians chapter 7. By the way, if you've never read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, let me just say this. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, not PG. Okay? Probably PG 13, depending upon the translation you're reading it in. It might, you know, edge a little more with the PG 13 even. All right? So, I'm not going to read the whole chapter today, but just know, like, if you faithfully read God's word, you are going to get into some real life circumstances. Paul's writing here to the church in Corinth. If you do any study, Corinth in the Greek world, in, in ancient Greece, was one of the most influential cities 
of its time. It had lots of trade. It, it was a place of great commerce and wealth. But it was also a place that had really, really dug into sin. Specifically, we know from Scripture, sensual and sexual in nature. That was kind of Corinth's weak spot. And Paul writes this church that he had helped to plant during his, I believe, his second missionary journey. Paul is in Ephesus in prison, kind of three-year imprisonment, and he's writing for kind of two different reasons. He writes, first of all, to correct the things that he's hearing and reports back to him what's going on in the church in Corinth. And he also is addressing specific questions. And this is really important to understand. There were questions that were arising from people in the church. And chapter 7, in fact, I didn't put this in your notes, chapter 7, the very first verse, and I'm just going to read it to you this morning, you can look it up for yourself. Now for the matters you wrote about, so here Bible, you can see it right there, now for the matters you wrote about, verse 1, he's like, listen, you asked me these questions, and here was one of the questions, is it good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman? Paul doesn't kind of hedge his bets at all there, does he? Now, the context, he goes on, and he says this in verse 2, but since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. Uh, the IV used to translate this verse is, now to the matters uh, you wrote about, is it good for a man not to marry? Okay. Basically, the question was, should we get married? And if we don't get married, basically, can we live as single adults and, and do what we want to do in the sexual area of our life? And that's the question they're asking. 2,000 years ago. And Paul says, listen, to the matter you wrote about, I'm going to answer your question. So he's going to talk to us in just in some really clear ways. What does it look like for the people in Corinth that are asking this question about the world around them? A very real question. A question they want to be answered to. And he's going to help us understand. So look down in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's get down to verse 8. Because by the way, Paul talks about all kinds of stuff in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. All right, so if you've got time later today, I encourage you to read it yourself. But I'm going to kind of look at a few specific verses to hit what we're talking about today. He says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 9. Verse 8. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay, what? Unmarried. As, and Paul was speaking with great authority, he says, as I do. Now listen, I want you to understand something. Paul lived with this incredible mindset. In fact, if you read the verses preceding this, Paul said, listen, the time is short. Uh, you know, we got a lot to get done. There are people that are dying and going to hell. Jesus is coming back. Uh, we need to live with urgency. And so listen, as I do, don't get married. Let's stay single. Why? Because there, and he's going to talk about the reason why in just a few moments. Because there, there are things that you can do as a single person that you can't do as a married person. Basically, it was a Paul saying. Verse 9. This is super encouraging, by the way. Right? Verse 9. I love Paul's comment here. But, if they cannot control themselves, <clears throat> they should what? Marry. I'm not sure if this is a positive indictment on marriage or not. <laughs> right? <laughs> For it is better to marry than to what? Burn with passion. I'm just going to let that scripture just sink in just for a few moments. We understand that all scripture is equally true, right? It's, it's good for people. Okay. Some of you are looking at me really weird this morning. What's Paul saying here? I mean, look at it. And, and, and by the way, I explained to you what Corinth was going through. The question they were asking. They were literally asking Paul, hey, um... Listen, is it okay if we don't get married? And really what they were wanting is they were wanting Paul to give them permission to practice whatever uh, sexual thing they wanted to in their society and not be married. And Paul said, listen, that's not how it works. It's not what God's plan is for you. And but Paul goes a little further and he says, listen, to the idea of singleness, it'd be better if you stayed single. And, and I'm going to show you why Paul said that in a few moments. But if you can't control yourself, then you should go ahead and get married. Or it's better for you to marry than to burn with passion. Now, I want you to hear me this morning. All right? Paul's talking very specifically to the church in Corinth. But I think it's something good for us to understand today. That there is one component. It's not something we like to talk about specifically in church. 
But um, I talked about it last week, too, in the whole idea of marriage. The physical intimacy part of a marriage it is, is certainly a huge part of the intimacy portion of that relationship. Okay? And as a church, often we talk about that area of our life as something bad and dirty when the scripture doesn't give us that indication at all. In fact, the only time scripture is negative toward that area of our life is if it's done outside of the confines of marriage. Inside the confines of marriage, scripture is incredibly uh, positive about the subject of physical intimacy. So where does that leave us? How does it frame the conversations we have? So one of the most uncomfortable conversations I've ever had in my life was when I had to talk with my oldest son. By the way, I, I um, listen, I, I understand what our kids are hearing in schools. You know what the saddest things to me as a pastor? I'm going to go off the rails here for just a second, so just bear with me. When I sit down with a young couple to do their premarital counseling, eventually we get to the subject of, of sex. And you are to see people's faces when I bring that up in marriage counseling and they suddenly realize they're going to have this conversation with their pastor. Okay. Now listen, you do it from a very godly perspective. We talk about things, but one of the questions I asked them is, hey, who did you first learn about that, the physical intimacy part of your life from? Like who was the person who kind of helped you to form your thoughts about it and stuff like that? I wish I could report to you today it was... It would, the, the, the young adults would tell me, or people who are married would tell me that their parents set them down and they had a good conversation, or that, that it was something that their families were open to talking about. I can tell you, universally, that's not the case. The vast majority of all couple, premarital couples I work with, everything they know about physical intimacy they find from popular culture and their friends. And we wonder why we have issues. I took my son a couple of years ago. He, he turns 12 here in a couple weeks, I believe. It was his 10th birthday. I say, 10, that's awful young. Yeah, it is. But his friends are talking about it. Listen, his friends, their dads are watching pornography and they've got magazines and they've got stuff and they're reading things and they're mentioning stuff. And listen, I either framed that conversation for him or his friends did. So for his 10th birthday, he and I went on a, uh, a dude retreat. Two of us. Guys, I'm going to tell you one of the most uncomfortable 36 hours of my entire life. I've been promising because he had, we just had this thing. And, and listen, he asks. He'll ask any question in the world. He'll come home some days and he'll ask a question. And I'm like, I just hope he doesn't see the fact that I'm turning red. <laughs> and he asks, well, what does this mean? I'm going, you obviously don't know her. You wouldn't be asking me that right now. And I made him a promise. I said, when he turned 10, I said, I'll answer any question you have. I'm not sure I should have made that promise, but it did. So I went on a guys retreat weekend. I took a little thing, a little book. Um, it's called the Passport to Purity. It's an incredible program, uh, but I think it tends to lean. The program itself tends to lean a little bit better uh, for girls. They tend, to, they tend to really love like some of the activities. My son was more into others, so like he and I went and like we would cover like a chapter of the book, and then we would go play laser tag. Right? We'd cover a chapter of the book and then I'd go let him eat all the hot dogs he wanted. So like, we just had fun. We spent the night in a hotel and he went swimming. And, and we just had these conversations. And we talked about physical intimacy. And I didn't frame it from the, from the, from the perspective of just, ooh, don't. I came into the perspective of why God created it and what it's meant for. And the fact that it's a beautiful part of our life when it's done correctly and, and that it has its place. Because listen, all about you, when I was a kid, anything I was told I shouldn't do, I was super curious about. So we reframe the conversation from a godly perspective. You say, Pastor, why is that important? Because it touches on this idea of our lives. When Paul says this, he's not being rude or crude or anything else. Paul's simply saying, listen, know yourself. Know yourself. Listen, being single is good, and maybe you're in the place of life that you are, and maybe you're, but listen, if you're not, that's okay. Know yourself. That's really what Paul's message is. And he says this, being single can be good. It can be good. Some of you may be saying, what's good about single? Listen, being single. Listen, talk to a few married people in the room, right? And I joke about marriage in this context, but listen, marriage is incredible when it's done right. Marriage done wrong is, that's why we have all these jokes, right? Because marriage done wrong is incredibly hard. And we see the pain and the carnage of it all over our society. 
Single people, though, also struggle with loneliness and boredom and seemingly unfulfilled, and yet Paul says it can be good. While I agree that marriage is the norm, seemingly the norm for most people, it is not necessarily for everyone. I mean, you don't have to look much further than Jesus, right? right? He lived an incredibly fulfilled life as a single person. Now, I get it. Some of you are like, yeah, but he was the son of God. Okay, touche. Sure. Yeah, right. But how about Paul? Paul's very clear. He says, listen, live unfettered as I do. He's like, there is a blessing to this. The fact of the matter is that while marriage is something that many single people will pursue, it is not necessarily something that God has created for every one of us. <laughs> Paul tells us that there are benefits of staying single. And today, I just want to kind of talk through a couple of those things for you. So, if you're a person that is looking to get married, you're single, listen, you're not wrong. But I also want to encourage those of you in the church that it's not our role to be matchmakers. As a church, some of the things that we can do is to begin to incorporate those that are single adults into the lives of our small groups, into the life, into just our lives, right? Spending time with them, integrating them into our activities. Why? This was the body of Christ. Much less seeing people as single and married, because churches used to do that, right? And part of that, I believe, was because like in 1950, I, this, I think in 1950, only 22% of adults were single. That's not literally the single people just by a small amount, not number of the married people. And so in the body of Christ, we are just going to have nearly the same amount of people that are single that we do married. And so it's just important that we are intentional about just doing life together, whether they're married or single, removing the latest. We need to be able to accept and honor people's decisions. So what are the good things? Let me give you a couple of thoughts. 1 Corinthians 7.28. 1 Corinthians 7.28. Paul says this, But if you do marry, you have not sinned, and if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face, what? Many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. Now, lest we think that being single means you don't have troubles, that's not what Paul is saying. Right? Jesus assured us in, in John 16, 33, that to take our in this world, you're going to have trouble. What's Paul saying? Paul's literally saying to, to the people that, that are single, that listen, there's something that happens when you get married. Scripture says you become one flesh. So what does that mean? That means that when you're married, not only do you have the troubles that you have, you also have your spouse's troubles. And a vast majority of the time, not every time, and not always, and it doesn't have to be that way, but, but a lot of times when people get married, eventually comes children. So guess what you have then? You have the troubles that come along with your kids. And not only do you have the troubles that come along with maybe as you're getting into adulthood, the troubles of aging parents, but now you also have the trouble, and about some of you are like, that's not what Paul's saying here, right? You also then have the implications of your spouse's aging parents. It sounds terrible to call it troubles, doesn't it? it sounds very, like, you know, distant. And, and, and that's not what Paul, but ultimately Paul is saying, listen, there are things that will impact your life. And what he's really saying is, listen, there is a financial and a time component to this. To make relationship work, there will be finances. Listen, uh, if you've got kids, those, those little guys are expensive. Right? Amen. And Paul's just warning us here and saying, listen, when you read Scripture, Paul's saying, he's saying listen, it's not that you sin, but those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you from this. What Paul, and maybe would have been would have been better to, to say is that you will have multiplied troubles because it's multiple people. I'm just really the, the implication that Paul's given. So the first thing, when he says it's good to remain single, Paul is saying that, that as a single person, you will literally face less troubles. <clears throat> Second thing that Paul says is found in 1 Corinthians 7, 32 to 30. By the way, I just want you to hear me this morning. It sounds like I'm advocating everyone to live a single, like, monistic life, doesn't it? <laughs> Not what I'm saying. I'm just simply pointing out to you how Paul answers this question. And I want you to pray. You have to pray through. Listen, it's not up to me whether you're single, you're a young adult, or you're widowed, or uh, you're divorced. It's not up to me whether you get married again or not. And listen, by the way, I don't care to make that decision for you. All right? 
Um, what I'm simply laying out to you is what the scriptures say about this area of your life. And that for so long, we've almost treated single people as like, you know, there's some other. And by the way, that's not what God's word says. God's word says, and that's why we're in this series of messages. We are the family of God. Single or married with kids, no kids. We're, we're his family. And how do we navigate with one another as a family? First Corinthians 7, this is chapter 1, verses 32 through 35. And I'm going to land the plane here in about the next five minutes. Maybe. <laughs> Verse 32. I would like you to be free from concern. As an unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. How he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world. How he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. By the way. That's, Paul's not, again, he's not making a positive or negative statement. He's just making a factual statement. You have, we talked about it last week, the laws of what? Of priority, right? Uh, of uh, purity. There are these things that stand into, by the way, the law of purity, whether you're single or you're married. But the law of priority drastically changes when you're single. Can you not verse An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. Verse 35, I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in what undivided devotion to the Lord. Paul is saying there is a unique thing that comes with undivided devotion. And that marriage does divide your devotion. And by the way, Paul knows that God's word teaches that it should. If you're going to be married and have this one flesh relationship, you must divide your devotion and your time. Again, God is the most important, but there will be less time, less resources, and less of those things to put, excuse me, to put in all those other areas of your life. Because you must prioritize that relationship. He's basically practically saying there are new responsibilities and cares that come with the married life. And that you should be aware of that. I think the biggest thing that Paul is saying is that if you find yourself in a single place, please, please, please be aware of the decision you're making. And I believe that's the cautionary thing that Paul is telling the people in Corinth. Yeah, he really he gives them the same. He says, listen, if you can't control yourself, it's better, you know, don't allow sexual sin to be the thing that undoes you. Pursue marriage. But he really drives back to this idea in this text of responsibilities. And I want to give you a couple of the practical, this practically speaking. I think I've already said it, but the first one is this, reduce financial responsibility. I talked about it earlier. Kids are expensive. You have to clothe them and feed them. And, right? If you have more kids, you have to have more bedrooms. I mean, just really practical things, right? You say, well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? I'm just simply saying there are... Um, Financial implications to being single. Reduce time responsibility. You literally have a reduction in time. Married people have responsibilities to their spouses and, and again, often to their kids. These are all part of being a good father and a mother. And being single frees you from some of the commitments of a married life. Being in a committed relationship means committing time not only to your family, but to the other person's family. It means spending time together. <coughs> spending time, often, listen, spending time often doing things that the other person wants to do. Let me illustrate it this way. How many guys in this room that are married would say that you've at least watched one movie in your life that you would have never watched had you not gotten married? <laughs> Come on, guys, don't lie to me. All right? You wasted a season of time. <laughs> Ladies, how many of you have watched at least one movie in your time if you're married that you would have never watched had you not gotten married? Right? And listen, that's just, that's low hanging. But we do it every time, right? We do it all the time. You know, I see guys all the time posting pictures of like being in knitting stores with their wives. <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole Facebook group, by the way, that are called like the board people at the mall. And you see, have you ever seen this? If you not, it's hilarious. There's like these pictures of these guys and some of them are like sleeping, you know, like in the mall, you know, just kind of waiting. Uh, I went, took, took my kids in to do some birthday shopping. There is some miserable people that are sitting in the middle of malls. <laughs> Lots of people in the store shopping, smiles on their faces. People in the middle of the mall on the benches that are like fighting for space. Miserable. Right? <laughs> All of those things flow out of these responses. That's what Paul's saying. 
See, listen, if you're single, you get to choose these things. When you're married, there's freedom. Now listen, some of you married people are saying, well, this kind of sounds good. <laughs> you just say, word from the Lord right now, it's too late for you. <laughs> you're committed. <laughs> Do not walk away from this thing. You know, Pastor built a really good case this morning for being single, so honey, I'm sorry, but uh, no. That, that is not what the Holy Spirit is saying to you today, all right? So I just want to clarify before anyone gets confused. So what are the responsibilities? Being single and Christian does not mean that you have freedom to sin. And also comes with it a, a set of responsibilities. I'll talk about these really quick. Although you do have probably more time and maybe more cash. Paul does hit on a few things. If you're not married, I believe Paul is saying to the single person, consider your advantages. And contemplate whether God is wanting you to remain that way. Whatever situation you find yourself, though, Paul would say, take advantage of that season. There are some practicalities to being single. If you are single by choice, maybe you're saying, you know what, I am, I'm just choosing to be single. I don't know that I don't want to get married. Singleness is not a license to be selfish. All of us are called, according to 1 Peter, to be holy as he is holy. There are standards we live our lives by. Being single does not mean that you have no responsibilities. Everyone has responsibilities toward God in the relationship with Him. You have relationship responsibilities with people around you. You're responsible to be a part of the body of Christ. You're responsible to live a holy life. Let me give you two of the, the, two of the biggest responsibilities you have. Because Paul hits on these very specific reasons. So what are these responsibilities? The first one is this. is to re refrain from sexual intimacy. It is one of the real things we don't like to talk about, but if you're going to be single, and listen, you got to make a choice. Are you going to live according to God's word or are you not? Okay? I'm not here to like parse conversations and all that This is what Paul, Paul literally addresses this to these people. He says, listen, if you're going to make this choice, that's a part of this choice. Listen, when my wife and I were dating, she was not allowed to come to my apartment unless other people were there. You said, well, that's pretty extreme. I'm like, yeah. I wanted to sleep with her because I thought she was beautiful. Is that a little too honest for some of you? <laughs> and I knew, listen, I'm just being honest. Listen, I was engaged. I was committed to her. And I said, but to maintain the level of purity we had decided to put up in our relationship, also knowing that I was also at that time a youth pastor in our church, and the youth pastor, you know, that, I'm not going to the whole implications of that. Okay. I just said, listen, you're not allowed to come to my apartment if no one else is there. Period. That's it. You know? And that was, by, by the way, that was the decision we both made, even after we were engaged. We had a short engagement, by the way. So <laughs> so I hurried that up a little bit. I'm really going off the rails now, aren't I? Um, but it was a choice for me. Why? Because I looked at God's word and said, I feel like this is important. I want to live by this thing. So I'm not just talking about something that's theoretical, something I've lived in my life. Remain free from that. But then also to use your time. Use your time. I, one of the things that when I was single that I would often do is I would go on, I would go on lots of spiritual retreats. Why? Because I could. I had the flexibility. Sometimes I would just decide on a Friday, I had a friend who would like, I'd just go. Spend 12, 24, 36 hours just, you know, no TV, no internet, nothing, just on my face before God. Why? Because I could. That changed. I got married. So use your time and your availability to grow with the Lord. Study His Word. Serve. Be a part of small groups. Discover your gifts. Be a part of multiple small groups. Serve in lots of places. Find a place to plug yourself in. Travel. Listen, there's so many incredible things that you can do. I want to talk to those for just a moment who are single but want to be married. First of all, all the things I just shared are important, right? But maybe you say, Pastor, I don't know that being single the rest of my life is what God has, but I am single now. What do you do? These are the last couple things. If someone's going to play, they can go ahead and play. I want to give you some advice to live well in the meantime. If you're in that waiting period between now and when you might be married or will be married one day, first thing is just pray for purity. I thought they remaining free from sin. But listen, in that season, pray for purity. Why is purity important? Listen, physical intimacy bonds a person. 
So I was like, I said, why did that person ever marry that person? Like, everyone can see the fact that that's not going to work. Well, if there's already physical intimacy, there is a bonding that has taken place. On every level, spiritually, physically, it just it bonds you to that person in a very real way. That's why God talks about that. He says, listen, this is meant to cement the relationship on an intimacy level. And if it's done outside, listen, it will cause you to do and see things in another person that otherwise you wouldn't do or see. It will cause you to put up with things that otherwise you wouldn't. So pray for purity. Second thing is don't lower your standards on who you'll marry. Listen, if you're aging or maybe you're single again or whatever, listen, don't lower your standards. I've seen incredibly godly people say, you know what? Well, listen, they don't really know Jesus, but no. Why? Because they used to be miserable. Like, you know, they got this little substance abuse issue, but other than that, they're a great person. I don't know why, but somehow we think we marry them, we're going to fix them. Listen, if they fought through that and they're on the other side and they're free, listen, that's, that's fine. But if they're in the middle of it, I promise you this, getting married isn't going to fix it. Don't lower your standard, whether it's non-believers or character issues or warning signs. Don't be so desperate to get married that you're willing to just put up with the first person who comes along. Don't allow marriage to become an idol. It's incredibly important if you're single and want to be married. Don't let marriage become an idol. That thing that you almost seek more than God himself. Refuse to see yourself as less than or damaged. See yourself the way God has created you to be. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be honest. In fact, I think one of the greatest things you can do is take full advantage of singleness to serve and to do missions and to get education and travel and also to, to, to begin to ask honest questions about yourself. Allow God to begin to purify you. Become the whole person that God wants to use inside of that relationship. But refuse to see yourself as less than or damaged. Take full advantage of your singleness. I talked about this a moment ago. And evaluate and be honest about areas in your life that need work. Just as a single person who chooses by choice to remain that way, God has gifted you with time. If you are finding yourself in a season of singleness, don't spend it trying to find Mr. or Mrs. Wright. Spend it in time fully pursuing Him. Understand that He is sovereign and that He will move in His time and His way. Would you stand with me this morning? If you're married in this room, I, I want to encourage you with some things. There are some things we talked about. I want to encourage you with the reality that we are the family of God. We talked to married people last week. We talked to single people. The next week, by the way, I'm going to talk about parenting. Uh, don't, don't not come because I'm talking about that next week, by the way. All right? There are some things that you can learn. Can I encourage you? Let's be the family of God. Maybe it would just, maybe this week it would just kind of, you know, as you're putting together a, a get together or something like that, make sure that we see less single and married and we just see the body of Christ and we include them in what we're doing. We spend time together. To the single people in the room, you know this, I love you. I can't make the decision for you whether it's God's will for you to get married or not. But if you're in a season of singleness, take advantage of it. And if a season of marriage comes, take advantage of that. And if you choose for whatever reason to say, I just feel as though God wants me to remain single, that's okay. In fact, following in the footsteps of Jesus and the Apostle Paul puts you in pretty good company. Father God, I thank you today for who you are. I've got to pray for your people. I've got to lift up those, of us, those in this room that are single adults, God. I gotta pray they would be encouraged today. I gotta pray that we would wrestle with your word today. Thank you, Father. If you're in this room and you're, you're a believer, just begin to pray. I'm gonna invite our altar team if they would come. These altars will be available to you today. If you've got a need, listen, don't leave today until you have one of our prayer team people pray with you. You so say, what are they gonna do? They're just gonna, they're gonna lay a hand on your shoulder and they're gonna agree in prayer with you according to what God's word teaches us in the book of James call for the elders of the church, have them anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith. And that God answers those prayers. That's what they're here for. Last thing, heads bowed, eyes closed, you're in here. I want to talk to anybody really quick. 
Maybe you say, Pastor, I heard you talk about all this stuff, but why would someone choose to live that way? Why would people, people even ask Paul that question? Here's why. Because that church in Corinth that was full of some Jews and mainly uh, uh, people who had been idol-worshiping Gentiles, completely ungodly, had come to Christ. And they were struggling with some areas of their life because they suddenly realized that God had a standard. If you're today, I want you to know something. God has a plan and a standard for your life. The plan is to know Him. The standard is to pursue Him. And God's word is clear that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And that sets you on this path of pursuing Him. And that's the people that Paul was talking about are those that had come to a relationship with Christ. So that's why they dared to ask the question about singleness and, 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 and purity of their physical intimacy. That's why they let Paul speak into their life about those things. So if you're here today and you've never made that commitment, I want you to know this. God loves you and He has a plan for your life. And if you'll call out to Him and ask Him to forgive you of your sin, and then say, listen, I got stuff going on. That's what these people did, and Paul wrote to them through the power of the Holy Spirit. He wants to do the same thing for you. So as I'm praying this final prayer, if that's you and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, would you just begin to pray this prayer and go something like this, Father, forgive me. You might not have all the words, but it's a simple conversation of God. I recognize I need you. I need Jesus to come into my life, and I need him to change me. If you do that today and you need to pray the prayer, you want to pray the prayer, you can find me or talk to the person who brought you. Because we want to be able to encourage you in your relationship with Christ. As soon as I'm praying, these altars are open. Father, I love you so much. God, I thank you for your people. God, go with them. God, I pray that you give them an incredible afternoon knowing you. God, bless those in our church that are single by choice or single for a season or single again or however that is. God, I pray that they would just sense your goodness. And God, in the midst of them becoming or doing or leading you toward, God, that they would fully live, fully engaged in this season of their life. God, I pray a blessing on them today. God, over this season and this time. God, I pray for those that have needs today. God, we trust you that you're the God that heals and provides and moves. God, I pray for those that need a relationship with you today. God, they would call out to you. That desperate prayer that says, God, I don't have it all together. I need to change. I need you today. Lord, I love you so much. And I praise you. Jesus, my name. Amen. 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 I love you guys.